Okay, so hi everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us today. The following, pre the following presentation is brought to you by nonprofit organization iExplore. I am honored today to be introducing our seminar presenter, Andy, um, who will be telling us all about the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918. So Andy, I'm passing it to you. Thanks, Emily, for her introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy. And today, what we're going to talk about is the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918. Okay? And before I get to that, we have a prologue. So currently, COVID-19 have ravaged our world. The outbreak of this virus, okay, has put the world on pause. Countless people lost their lives and you know, in the 19th century, humans faced a greater threat. It was the Spanish flu. Today, we're going to discuss similarities between the Spanish flu, COVID-19. We're going to discuss why the Spanish flu was so deadly. We're going to discuss impact the Spanish flu had on human society. And we're also going to discuss key takeaways and lessons that humans can learn from the Spanish flu to help us cope with our current little problem, COVID-19. With that, let's dive straight into the Spanish flu. So, Spanish flu duration. The Spanish flu lasted from 1918 to 1920. Roughly around 200 million people died during the outbreak. The exact number of people could either be greater or a little bit smaller, but it is not exactly known because medical records at the time was very primitive, and many countries did not keep medical records. By many countries, I mean countries back then that, was, that did not have a developed and modern medical system and was, so, was thus incapable of keeping such records. This resulted in 200 million being the best estimate that we have, and it is an estimate that most experts agree on. And this estimate means that the Spanish flu killed more people than World War I and World War II combined. And if you don't know, World War I and World War II are the two biggest military conflicts that ever occurred in human history. And those two combined did not kill as much people as the Spanish flu. This says that humans are not each other's worst enemy and that actually the worst enemy of humans is invisible. It is everywhere, but invisible. It is microorganisms. It is disease-causing pathogens, right? These are actually the most, <clears throat> you know, scary enemies of humanity. And today, let's explore this enemy of humanity, right? And starting with the Spanish flu. So, first of all, we have to have some clarifications. The flu is called the Spanish flu, right? Just by the name, of course, everybody is going to think that this flu, it's called Spanish flu. It's going to be for coming from Spain, right? But is the Spanish flu actually coming from Spain? It isn't. The Spanish flu is not from Spain. Experts guess that the Spanish flu is either from China, America, or some other European countries. But all experts agree on that the Spanish flu did not originate in Spain. Well, then why is it called the Spanish flu, right? There, there's something weird here. It's called the Spanish flu, but it's not from Spain. Well, the reason goes down to World War I. So if you don't know, 1918 was still technically doing World War I. <clears throat> it, okay? it was near the end of it, but it was doing World War I. And out of all the major countries at the time that was, you know, sort of like a major world power and whose medical records and reports are actually being taken seriously, Spain was one of the only ones that was not involved in the conflict of World War I. And that was why Spain was the only country that was actively reporting on the flu. Okay. Why didn't other countries that were involved in the conflict not report on the flu? Well, for example, France, UK, and Germany, they were fighting each other, right? America was helping France and UK. They were in a war. And when you're in a war, the last thing you want to do is make your enemy think that you're weak, okay? What is a key sign that you're weak? Of 
course, a big disease outbreak in your country, right? What is, what is more like a signal of you know, internal weakness than a disease outbreak in your country? Not really anything, except for some natural disasters, right? So of course, countries that are actively involved in conflict, such as Germany, other European countries, and you know, France, England, <clears throat> and the US, didn't report on the flu. Okay, the flu has been around this whole time. It was around during World War I, but no report on it except for Spain. And this was because Spain was neutral. That means that they didn't have to care about, you know, I can't report this because, you know, I'm gonna get attacked. No, they don't have to care about that. They can just report it, right? And what's funny to note is that if you, tra if you travel in time, okay, you build a time machine, you travel back to the, uh, you know, Spanish outbreak, National outbreak, how to stand during that time. Like, what you actually get from the Spanish newspapers was they were calling it the French flu. They weren't calling it, you know, the Spanish people were calling it the French flu, right? So it wasn't starting from um, Spanish, Spain at all. The most probable theory so far is that the Spanish flu originated from a military base in the US, right? And it spread from that military base to other military bases within the U.S. And then after when, like, you know, the U.S. joined World War I to help the cause of the Triple Alliance, which is the side that was against Germany, a.k.a. France, England, you know, those countries, America sent the troops overseas to Europe. And that brought the Spanish flu to Europe, okay? There was even records that the American president, Woodrow Wilson, Contracted, contracted Spanish flu, okay? That means that the most probable theory is Spanish flu actually originated from America, which technically could get it called the US flu. But I mean, nobody calls it that. So let's just call it the Spanish flu, okay? And also keep in mind that the theory that it comes from the United States is the most supported and backed theory, okay? It is still a theory. That means that it is not 100% clear. Not, not like almost no data about this outbreak is exactly clear because of wartime sensors and other factors such as underdeveloped countries, as I already explained. That means that it, is, it was impossible for scientists to determine exactly where this horrible disease came from. But for now, we have to just say it probably came from America, okay? <clears throat> anyway, how did H1N1 appear? By the way, you know, you know the, 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 the like outbreak is called the Spanish flu. The virus that caused this outbreak, it was called the H1N1. It's very similar to COVID-19, right? The outbreak is called COVID-19, right? But the actual virus is called SARS-CoV-2, okay? So the virus has a different name from the actual outbreak, right? You know, for COVID-19, the scientific name of the outbreak is you know, coronavirus disease discovered in 2019, and the virus is called severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. The Spanish flu, well, they didn't have that fancy names, right? They didn't have names that are that fancy. The virus is just called H1N1. The outbreak was just called the Spanish flu, right? So H1N1, the virus, it's classified as a type of swine flu. So there are actually three types of flu, three major types, okay? Repeat, three major types of flu. They're avian flu, swine flu, and human flu. So avian flu is flu that, like, majority of the cases are present in birds. Swine flu, majority of the cases are in pigs. And human flu, of course, are usually infecting humans. Okay, now you might ask, hey, this is a swine flu. Why did it start infecting humans, right? It's supposed to go infect pigs. Okay, why, why does it come to us? And the reason, well, I'm going to explain the reason in a bit more detail later, but I'm going to tell you guys right now that viruses can crossbreed with each other to produce super viruses that can cross infect species. Okay. And since H1N1 was originally a swine flu, that means humans didn't have any pr like previous knowledge on how to deal with it. And that was part of why it was so deadly. Okay. And Yes, the process of virus, you know, coming together is called an antigenic shift. And it is when viruses combine with each other 
<clears throat> okay? So viruses are basically a protein shell with RNA inside, or it can be DNA. It's a like protein coating with genetic material inside. That means that it's very easy for them to either mutate or merge with other viruses. How this merging occurs is when, let's say you have a pig cell, right? A swine flu virus affects this pig cell. It doesn't mean no other virus can affect it, okay? So this cell is affected by a swine flu virus. Now along comes a human flu virus that has mutated just enough to affect pigs and affects the exact same cell, I mean, exact same cell. And then also along comes an avian flu virus that just mutated enough to just barely be able to affect pigs and affects the exact same cell. And now you have one cell with like three viruses affecting it. And um, if any of you understand the replication process of a virus, well, it injects its own genetic material into the cell that it's affecting and making the cell produce viral proteins, thus producing new viruses. But of course, when you have three different viruses injecting their genetic material into the exact same cell, you're gonna get mixed up. So scientists speculate this is what happened, right? A pig got affected with both with a strain of avian flu, a strain of swine flu, and a strain of, of human flu together, okay? And all of these merged together inside this pig and infected back into humans. And we got ourselves H1N1 and the Spanish flu outbreak, okay? The antigenic shift is very common, actually. <clears throat> Previously in 2013, the Ebola outbreak occurred, right? We're actually going to have a seminar on, Ebola, you know, on the Ebola outbreak soon. So stay tuned. But anyway, scientists also speculate that the Ebola out, like the Ebola virus, was sort of like a semi, also used the antigenic shift to sort of transform between the Marburg virus, which is another virus that is not as deadly as Ebola, but also pretty horrifying, into the actual boss, the Ebola virus, right? So really remember the antigenic shift. This is a very, very important, um, you know, key factor in how disease developed right? A lot of, you know, bacteria, viruses, and other pathogens came from animals to humans to antigenic shift, okay? You have not just Ebola, you have tuberculosis, right? You have Nipah virus, right? Malaria, okay? All these antigenic shifts. That is really important. This is the keystone of this PBT. And even guys taking notes, remember it. Okay, now, <clears throat> we have to move on to the reasons why H1N1 was so deadly. Okay, reason number one. I sort of already explained this previously, right? But H1N1, it was a brand new virus, okay? And what this means is that, look, the human immune system is designed to fight viruses, right? But our immune system, it isn't perfect. You know, nothing in the world is perfect. You can't expect it to be perfect. So how your immune system works is you have these white blood cells called leukocytes otherwise known as CD4 plus T cells, they will swim around your bloodstream and everywhere looking for viruses, bacteria, or parasites, or any other pathogens that manage to make it into your body, right? <clears throat> and if these blood cells recognize that, hey, you don't belong here, he's going to target it and destroy it, right? He's going to destroy the pathogen, right? This sounds like a very good system, but there's a problem. Anybody think what's the problem? Like there's a big problem here. And the problem is what if your white blood cell doesn't recognize the pathogen as a pathogen? Well, then <laughs> we got a problem here. You're gonna get sick. So when H1N1 first infected, you know, started affecting human, human immune system had absolutely no idea on how to deal with this virus. They didn't ever, like your white blood cells had never even seen anything remotely close to this virus before, okay? So a lot of times the human immune system either, like, so first of all, it wouldn't be able to kill the virus fast enough in the early stage because it wouldn't be able to recognize it. And when the virus starts being a problem and your immune system actually recognizes it, the immune system doesn't have, doesn't know like how to effectively kill the virus, right? <clears throat> right? Like it doesn't know how much effort it needs to put to kill this virus. And what like we, the doctors at the time saw a lot with, um, the H1N1 patients was that your immune system overreacted, okay? And it ended up killing the person infected with the virus because the immune system reacted way too violently, causing like, you know, the person that has this virus, their lungs to fill up with fluid, 
right? The flu and the common cold, okay, let me just put this here. They are types of viruses that affect your respiratory system, aka your lungs. So your immune system overreacts in the lungs, it leads to pneumonia. Pneumonia means immense amounts of fluid building up in your lungs, right? And back in 1980, we don't have, you know, advanced ventilators, you know, systems to draw the fluid out, you know, you know intensive care unit support wasn't that great and all that. And, you know, we didn't have any of that, okay? So that was a part of the reason why H1N1 had an incredibly high death toll, okay? It was an, let me go through this again so you guys can remember it clearly. Number one, brand new virus, immune system couldn't detect it fast enough to stop it from causing infection. Number two, when it did get detected, immune systems often overreact and end up killing the host. Number three, you know, healthcare systems back then didn't know how to deal with this virus, okay? All these contributed, I mean, mainly because this virus is new, right? For example, if you have tuberculosis trying to cause wide outbreak, doctors back then already knew of tuberculosis, they knew what to do with tuberculosis, right? They knew how to treat tuberculosis, they knew what the patient needed, and they knew to, you know, how to stop tuberculosis from spreading. Tuberculosis wouldn't spread that easily. But in the Spanish flu, on the other hand, it's completely new, right? It's sort of similar to COVID-19 in a way, how it just like appeared, right? And the and countries really didn't have like wasn't really prepared to deal with it. And, it's, and it was very similar to how COVID-19 killed. You know, same way. If you die from COVID-19, it's because your immune system overreacted and caused pneumonia. If you die from Spanish flu, it's because your immune system overreacted and caused pneumonia. But COVID-19 was, was a lot less effective than H1N1 as co at causing pneumonia. That's why COVID-19 is sitting at a death rate of around 2%. And H1N1 is sitting at death rate around 50 to 60%, okay? That means out of 100 people infected with H1N1, around 60 of them die, no matter what age, even healthy young adults. Well, COVID-19 killed about 2% of uh, the people infected, which means out of 100 people infected, two were killed. And mostly it was targeting elder people, elderly people, okay? That's what H1N1 it's debatable right now because H1N1 didn't spread as much as COVID-19, but it's debatable that H1N1 is actually a lot more scary than COVID-19, okay, because of its incredibly high death toll. Anyway, second reason of why H1N1 was so deadly, it was that the Spanish flu appeared in World War I, okay. I already previously explained that this virus appeared in World War I, resulted in the fact that Countries could not report it. Like, they just cannot because of wartime censorship. Wartime censorship, right? You cannot report that your country has disease to, other, to your enemies. It just doesn't work that way. Like, for example, if you're in a fist fight with somebody, right? You're not going to tell them, hit me on the head. I'm really weak there. You're not going to do that. So, of course, countries in doing war are not going to report on the weaknesses, which resulted in that Spanish flu wasn't, you know, it wasn't known. People didn't know it was there. They didn't know of danger, okay, right? And they couldn't act fast enough because, like, the time that, at, like, everybody started to report on this virus, it was already way too late. It, it was already everywhere, okay? <clears throat> that was a reason. Second reason, when you have a war, right, everybody picture this. You have the world, okay? It's a, the world, okay? A big portion of the world's countries are fighting each other. Especially back in the 1980, like I 1918, like you know, it was very a long time ago. How do people fight? Okay, they weren't using high tech, of, like you know, drones or missiles. They were like calling huge, massive numbers of troops to gather together in filthy trenches, right? And the soldiers are gonna stay in those trenches for months without leaving. Okay, close in close space, dirty in close space, with a ton of dirty people that are very stressed and injured because of war. And war is also going to cause, you know, lack of food. And, you know, when you're hungry, you're more susceptible to disease equals to H1N1, you know, just massively spreading. Battlefields and, you know, groups where of soldiers gathering and retreating after the war and then all that was basically incubation, like, officially like petri dishes for this virus. Okay, it was such a good time for a mega disease virus, like mega disease just started spreading because the world's in chaos and 
everywhere was huge, massive gatherings of people, over tens of thousands of them, right? You know, back then, the German army was like, you know, like, for example, I command 10,000 troops to attack the location, right? It weren't like I had command 100, right? It was like a massive scale, okay? And the last reason why World War I made this thing so deadly was that, you know, very, very similar to the first point of countries didn't report it, was that countries had more things to worry about than contain this disease because, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> countries were too worried about fighting their opponents and recovering economically from the war to really put an effort into quarantining, you know, researching vaccines or cures or anything, right? And back then, the medical ecology was pretty bad as well, okay? So, the so second reason why Spanish flu, it was because World War I <clears throat> just messed everything up, right? It's actually, here's an important lesson, okay? When we find a brand new disease, it is very important that this disease gets contained in the stages of spread, okay? <clears throat> if this disease gets contained very early on, it's not going to do anything, right? For example, let's say a virus starts in a country, right? If the country immediately shuts down the virus, that's it. You're not going to hear from this virus anymore, okay? It's similar to Ebola virus, okay? The Ebola virus, you know, appeared in Af Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me. You got pretty fast, like, countries shut it down pretty fast because, you know, people are alarmed about it. They shut it down. You know, global, global, global action to shut down Ebola, right? And it just stopped. It didn't really spread beyond Africa and like five cases in the US. The Spanish flu, however, was a whole different story. Countries too busy fighting each other to, you know, shut down the virus. So it was allowed to just, you know, ravage the entire world, okay? So last but not least, we have the third reason why H1N1 was so dead, because it was such a new fight. I know I sort of explained previously that it was a new virus and that's why it was so deadly, but here um, we are going to explain it in depth. So because H1N1 was such a brand new virus, there's no medication proven to treat it, okay? <clears throat> so if you go to the hospital sick with H1N1, the, the doctors does not know how, what to do with you, right? All their previous like, knowledge of medicine didn't work, okay? And, you know, you see a lot of doctors makeshift, you know, grabbing some medicine that they sort of thought worked, but actually didn't really work and just giving it to patients, right? And of course, this didn't help. And mass amounts of people just died. Okay. Also, since H1N1 was allowed to spread because of the reasons that I told you guys previously, there was just so much people infected, right? It's basically like, you know, you hear a lot of experts talking about the curve, you know, these days for COVID-19. So basically what this means is that why you have to fight in the curve is because you don't want the amount of people infected to be more than the ability of a country's medical system to treat, you know, like the capacity of the medical system. At this point, the Spanish flu was a jagillion times over the capacity of most countries' medical system, right? And this resulted in a lot of like collapse of the medical system. Hospitals are absolutely overflowing with patients, okay? And a lot of warehouses and storehouses were turning into makeshift hospitals for H1N1 patients, okay? And it was just horrible, right? People being stacked together like this. Let me see if I can point to it. Like this picture here in rows of beds just waiting to die in these massive, like, unsanitary warehouses, right? They're stacked here. They, they, they couldn't be helped because the medical community didn't know how to deal with it, okay? It was just, it's so alien to them, right? Okay. So, well, I guess there is a last reason why H1N1 is so deadly, and I slave it up here, because this is the most ridiculous sounding reason. Doctors are dumb. So doctors didn't know what medication to give to patients. What ended up happening is, Doctors end up prescribing either absolutely useless medication to patients or downright harmful medications to, you, to patients, okay? One of those examples is aspirin, okay? I'm pretty sure all of you guys have heard about aspirin, right? You know, the common medication to treat, you know, you can have a little headache, take some aspirin, bro. 
you know, a little bit of back pain, take some aspirin, bro, right? It's very common medication. But back in the 19th century, like especially the early stages, like, you know, during the Spanish flu outbreak, this medication, doctors thought that it was like, you know, it worked against the Spanish flu. And the reason was that I believe most of you know this, but, you know, when you catch the common flu or, you know, the common cold, one of the most common symptoms is, of course, headaches and fevers, right? It is no different for the Spanish flu. It is still a flu, right? Even though it's very deadly from a flu, it's still a flu, okay? So you still start with your typical, you know, fever and, you know, headache, runny nose, coughs, and then it worsens, right? But, you know, it seems like aspirin is supposed to treat it because aspirin is sort of effective against fevers and headaches. Nowadays, we have more advanced medications like acetaminophen and ibuprofen, but back then, doctors just believed in aspirin, right? So they, or how much were they giving patients? Doctors prescribed 30 grams of aspirin a day for patients, okay? And this was actually suggested by the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control, okay? These two organizations both suggested, you know, giving patients 30 grams of aspirin a day to help combat, you know, Spanish flu and its symptoms, right? Governments were like, you know, stockpiling hospitals with aspirin. What's the problem with giving people aspirin, you know, 30 grams of aspirin a day? Well, by today's standards, more than four grams of aspirin a day is very, very unsafe, okay? Because aspirin is not like, you know, it's not like candy or something, okay? It's toxic. If you eat a lot of it, it's going to poison you. So studies have shown that in a few months that aspirin was, 30 grams of aspirin was suggested to Spanish flu patients, most of the patients died because of aspirin poisoning, okay? Studies have shown that aspirin poisoning actually, you know, it also affects the neuros, the like, you know, nervous system and the respiratory system, which means a lot of patients will have a virus that's affecting their lungs and aspirin poisoning that's also affecting their lungs. So it's basically like somebody stabbed a knife into your lungs, then shot you in the lungs, okay? And a lot of them just died because aspirin didn't really fight the virus and they were getting poisoned by it because they were eating way too much, okay? This just showed that in the face of disease, what actually is needed is for people to calm down, you know, don't panic, doctors as well, and to slowly experiment to see which drugs are safe, right? Aspirin didn't go through enough testing for doctors and companies to know what is a safe dosage for, okay? So that's why this incredibly high overprescription was happening, okay? Nowadays, why does, you guys don't have to worry about this right now, but nowadays, there is this thing called clinical trials where every time a new drug rolls off the production line, it has to go through four phases of clinical trials. Number one is on animals, and then small scale clinical trials on very, very limited amounts of patients that volunteered for it to see if it actually works. And then another stage with slightly more people to test mainly the safety and effectiveness in a large group. The last stage of clinical trial, okay, for mainly for safety, at this point, okay? And actually, this is actually a very hard process. Usually around, let's say, 10 drugs go for a clinical trial. One of them makes it all the way through. That's already very amazing, okay? That means the rate of development for new drugs is actually incredibly slow. And the last why you can see a lot of time, especially with the COVID-19 situation right now, scientists are actually looking at pre-existing drugs such as remdesivir, okay, to help treat coronavirus instead of trying some new untested chemical concoction, okay? That's the reason. It's a lot of work. It's actually very hard and can be very unsafe. But doctors back then didn't understand this. And this was the last and final reason why Spanish flu was so deadly. It was helped along by the, you know, doctors not having enough knowledge, right? So we talked about a lot about how, why the Spanish flu was incredibly deadly. But I mean, as I already previously said in my first ever slide, I, 
the Spanish rule lasted from 1918 to 1920. And then after that, I think a lot of you guys know what happened to it. It just stopped, okay? It just literally just, it's just gone, okay? It's just basically like SARS. It just suddenly, just out of nowhere, it's just boom, it stopped, okay? Why did it stop? Okay, the Spanish flu, you know, I, already, I talk so much about how powerful this virus is, how fast, how efficiently it destroys the human body, how doctors are so helpless against it, how hospitals are getting overwhelmed. But why did it just stop? Well, there's a couple of reasons. And the most important one lies within the virus itself. And it is the high death rate of the Spanish flu. A lot of you might be, um, you know, leaving the meeting right now because you're saying, you're probably thinking that, hey, ain't, isn't it that the more deadly disease, the better, the stronger it is? Okay, that's not a bad thing. The deadliness of a disease isn't a bad thing. Actually, from a, disease, like, the, from the perspective of the actual pathogen, it is. And the reason is the goal of a pathogen, okay, this is very important for all of you to keep in mind, the goal of any pathogen, any disease causing agent is not to kill you. It is to make offspring and spread to other people, other hosts, so they can keep producing. It is 100% not to kill you, right? It doesn't actually want you to die. It wants you to keep living so it can keep reproducing inside you, okay? And it also wants to keep living so it can spread it to other people. That's why diseases such as the common cold is actually incredibly, you know, successful. It's still around today because when you get the cold, you just get a little sniffle, right? And you still move around your day and you just end up affecting everybody that comes in contact with you, okay? The Spanish flu. This disease was known to kill people in four hours. Four hours, okay? So basically, let's say you were infected with Spanish flu at 6 p.m. in the afternoon. You had a chance of being dead by 10 p.m. on the exact same afternoon with all treatments given to you, with all treatments possible given to you. It was that crazy, okay? And the Spanish flu's death rate, as I already said, was 50 to 60%, okay? That means out of 100 people in FEX, around 50 to 60 of them down. And if you're on a course to dying from a disease, well, you're probably not going to be in the shape to walk around within at least the first day, right? Because if you're gonna die from a disease, it usually is a disease that progresses pretty fast, right? And the Spanish flu progresses really fast, okay? There were reports of, there was like, you know, there was a journal written by a doctor at the time. He says a healthy 30 year old man, okay, came into his hospital with very light flu-like symptoms, you know, light cough, like fever, you know, headache, you know, nothing else to worry about, right? He comes in the hospital. That night, he's in, in, he's in the um, intensive care unit, right? He's struggling on the brink of life, okay? Barely able to get any oxygen gas exchange in his lungs, okay? Com like, basically unconscious, okay? So that's how fast the Spanish flu progresses. And why this was bad is because people wouldn't, have the amount of time that they would have to spread it to other people, okay? If you look at COVID-19 right now, you have a lot of people with very light cases of COVID-19 that's very easy to be mistaken for the common cold or the, you know, the common version, not the Spanish, not this one that we're talking about, the common flu, right? So people can change their lives with that. And also, a lot of people infected with our coronavirus, COVID-19, is asymptomatic. That word means that you are infected with the virus, you can still spread it to people, but you don't have any signs that you're infected with the virus, okay? This isn't the case with Spanish flu. It's just outright, you know, it, it just kills you, right? So it's basically saying that the Spanish flu doesn't want its, it is, it's not very good for it, its own good because it kills you too fast, okay? There's actually a lot of examples throughout history of diseases that exist, right? And their primary, primary host is humans. Important word here, primary host is humans. That means their primary target is humans and usually only target is humans, okay? 
there's been a lot of those diseases that their death rate literally declines in a straight line downwards. Okay. And a main example is syphilis. We're not going to have a, this syphilis is a pretty major pandemic, but we're not going to have a seminal syphilis because it's actually quite an in, uh, inappropriate disease for a lot of you. But syphilis, his death rate was nearing 90% when it first appeared. Okay. It was called the French disease. It was very horrible. People were very scared of it. His death rate was incredibly high. Right now, syphilis death rate is like almost zero. All syphilis would do is some postules at certain parts of a human body and nothing else. Why? Because the syphilis bacteria realized that if it killed people too fast, especially with the way syphilis spread it, it wouldn't have enough time to spread to other people, right? So slowly got less and less deadly, right? But then the Spanish flu, it didn't have time to go through this process because yes, it killed people way too fast, progressed way too fast. And also because of this reason, strict measures of quarantine were placed right after World War I and the major outbreak started. So during World War I, of course, countries cannot place the measures because you know, they weren't really, you know, even realizing there was this flu here, you know, they were too busy fighting the war, right? But right after the war, countries realized the danger, okay? The flu was ravaging across Europe, Asia, the Americas, even some parts of Africa and South America, everywhere, okay? It was just ravaging the world, killing millions of people. So of course, like, you know, reasonable human beings, the government of countries implemented very strict quarantine measures just like, you know, countries did with coronavirus, okay? Now, just imagine this. Country, a lot of countries like China and Singapore, you know, they're going all out, you know, super strict lockdown, 30-something cases, the entire city is, like, locked off kind of thing on a disease with a death rate of 2%. What would governments be like on a disease with a death rate of almost 60%? Okay, it will be an insane amount of, you know, measures to try to contain. So, you know, and also, there's actually some very funny measures. I'm going to have some honorable mentions for interesting measures that people implemented. Mayor of one American city decreed that all businesses have to have different times for their um, people to work, which means that, for example, one business starts work at 9 o'clock, and no other business can do that. Other businesses have to pick a different time to start work and in work. Reason? So that, pe not the, so that the subway stations are crowded. Okay? So people were like, you know, they're, like they're juicing out the brains for ideas to try to contain Spanish flu, right? So a lot of potential vulnerable individuals that the Spanish flu could infect, the Spanish flu couldn't get to them because they were being good people and stay in quarantine. And it's also worth noting that a disease that kills you with the, um, the strategy of the Spanish flu does is actually hard, harder, I mean, for, for it to infect you if you have a strong immune system, right? And a lot of people back then, they were using different kinds of ways to boost their immune system to help them be um, you know, strong to this virus. It actually kind of worked. I mean, eating a lemon a day or something like that probably doesn't, but there's a story, okay, of one American family, um, the mom of the family, at the start of the Spanish outbreak, just the flu started, it's on the newspaper, she immediately changed the diet of their entire family to include one thing, onions. Breakfast, onions. Lunch, onions. Dinner, onions. And guess what? It, his, her entire family didn't even get sick once during the Spanish flu. Not just, you know, they didn't get the Spanish flu. They didn't even get any other diseases either, okay? So all those measures together didn't give our Spanish flu enough time, you know, to drop his death rate, to chillax, you know, and try to, and become a seasonal thing. It didn't give it the chance. It was halted. Okay, it was halted. So another reason why the Spanish flu stopped, say no to disease. The flu can be affected by season, okay? Any respiratory virus, okay, can be affected by season, okay? To be specific, 
any virus of the coronavirus genera can be effect, like coronavirus family can be affected by the season. And even though the Spanish flu is called H1N1, it isn't called something something coronavirus. Guess what? It is actually a type of coronavirus. Surprise. Okay, it is at, like all flu viruses, and the COVID-19 virus, and the SARS virus that you know was present you know back in 2003. They're all types of coronavirus. Coronavirus is this big family of viruses. Okay. Not all coronavirus are actually going to affect humans. I think only six of them does. Okay, one of them is the Spanish flu virus. So these coronaviruses, they're affected by the season. Why? Look, right now we have in most, you know, you know, North American countries in Europe and you know Asia as well. They have this thing called the flu season. When is the flu season? Is usually in winter and late fall. And the reason for that is. The ability of a respiratory system virus to infect the cells on your respiratory system is, the, is determined greatly by the amount of moisture. Surprise, it is. So the more dry your respiratory tracts, the less mucus it is there to stop the virus and the more easily it is for the virus to infect. And air is usually a lot drier by you know, late fall and winter, yes. Dry air has an effect on the ability of a virus to kill you. It does. Also, you know, we in winter, right? In summer, people are usually outside, you know, playing basketball, you know, enjoying the sun, you know, just generally having a good time. It's usually outdoors. And what's good about the outdoors? Wind, right? And sun. These two, the wind can blow away the virus so that it doesn't stay in one place. And even if you cough, out the virus, strong goes to the wind, next person that walks over here, they won't get affected because the virus got blown away. The sun can also significantly reduce the lifespan of all, basically all viruses when they're not in a human body, right? Let's say, for example, the Spanish flu can sit on a table, an oak wood table. Let's say, for example, can sit there for two days in like a room. If you put it outside in the sun, it can probably only survive maybe half a day, right? Because of UV radiation from the sun. And the sun drying out, you know, the virus with its heat. So, the, so like the Spanish flu, it was like pretty apparent that the season did have a sort of like, you know, effect on it because it sort of stopped around late spring of 1920. And late spring is usually when the flu season ends with us, okay? So, you guys probably really surprised by this, but let me tell you, season has a significant effect on the ability of the disease to spread, especially with, you know, these factors, you know, these two factors playing together with seasons, you got Spanish flu shut down, okay, which is a big hooray for humanity, of course, and, you know, countries start recovering from the Spanish flu right after impact of the Spanish flu. So the Spanish flu is a disease with a death toll of around 200 million people, okay? That is more than the population of a lot of countries. For example, Canada. It is more than the population of Canada, right? Like a few times more, right? So it had huge negative impacts on the world, right? Through all the quarantine measures, you know, all the people it killed. What if I told you it had positive impacts? Wouldn't believe me, right? But it did. What positive impact did it have? Well, it brought the scientists' attention to flus. It told scientists that, hello, scientists, you know that flus can also be deadly, right? Please pay some attention to flus. So scientists started paying a lot more attention to flu, like just the disease flu. And what you got is a lot more research into seasonal flu outbreaks you know, the common flu. And what this, what this did was it made the seasonal flu a vaccine possible. Okay, you guys might just be like, you know, the flu is just a minor annoyance. Why would we care if a flu vaccine was developed? Well, the truth is the common flu actually has the same death rate about, about the same death rate as COVID-19, around 2%, okay? 
and many people, like hundreds of thousands of people, still die from flu-related complications each year. That number would be a lot higher without the protection of seasonal flu vaccines. Okay, a lot of people are actually very susceptible to the just the normal flu. Not just even the Spanish cut, just normal cut. For example, you know, old people, you know, just newborn children. They're very susceptible to um having flu-related you know complications. So here I need to make a clarification. The common flu, you know, the, the the complications from the common flu is different from the Spanish flu. It doesn't cause your lungs to fill up with fluid, but it does open up your lungs for bacteria to come. And bacteria is going to cause bacterial pneumonia, which is a lot more deadly than, you know, the common flu. So that's why the flu vaccine is important, because if, you're the, if the gateway never opens, the horrifying beast, which is bacterial pneumonia, never comes in, right? So this was a very, very big positive impact. Um, it, it allowed the seasonal flu vaccine to be developed, okay? And also it developed, uh, it also made scientists put a lot of research into researching medications that can help against flu. You know, you got a lot, like a lot of antivirals right now that's targeting against flu, right? Very, you know, you go, you go tell the doctor about the flu, they actually have things to prescribe to you that actually helps and doesn't poison you. Of course, that part is important. Okay. So, Spanish flu had a huge, tremendous impact on, you know, the world through the medical field, right? The medical field. It also had a huge impact on the world through the fact that it killed a ton of people. And it also had a huge impact on the world through the fact that scientists and doctors who were very cocky. Cocky means proud and, you know, conceit, you know, inflating egos, right? They were, you know, those scientists and doctors recognized that, no, humans haven't won against disease yet, right? Spanish flu was sort of like, you know, the side of microorganisms going up to humans and giving them a big solid slap to tell them, bro, we are still here. You have to keep researching on us, right? They had an impact on that, right? It, all these very important impacts on the world, of course, okay? And it even contributed to the start of World War II, right? By causing, you know, German people, by causing unrest in the German people, right? Because, you know, German people are already pretty unhappy about losing a war, having a treaty of Versailles, having to pay a lot of money to France and, and Britain because they lost the war, and then now you have a disease outbreak, right? What other impacts does Spanish flu have? The Spanish flu had a lot of impacts economically on the world, right? So right now we have COVID-19, again, a disease that isn't as scary as the Spanish flu. Still quite scary, not as scary as the Spanish flu. What's happened to the world? A lot of countries' economy is basically put on hold or put severely to the test because of quarantine or lockdown, okay? Countless businesses everywhere are suffering, right? Businesses are going bankrupt, especially those small businesses, such as small private-owned restaurants, barbershops, and all that. And big companies are also taking a huge hit. A lot of companies are firing a ton of workers because they can't, you know, you don't have enough consumers. You know, the travel industry, the cruise, the, you know, the cruise ships. Nobody rides those cruises anymore. Everybody's scared of coronavirus. Nobody's riding cruise ships anymore, right? Cruise industry is almost down. The, air, the aviation industry, commercial aviation industry, right? Airlines are retiring planes early from lack of demand, right? And it is just corona, and it's COVID-19. It's not even the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu had an enormous impact on the global economy because a lot of businesses went bankrupt, okay, by the ruling of the government. They had to go bankrupt because they weren't allowed to open anymore, right? If you're a small shop owner and you, your shop can't open anymore, then how are you going to get any food? How are you going to get any food? How are you going to, like, pay your bills, right? You, you, of course, you, go, you declare bankruptcy and start collecting aid from the government and, you know, trying to live. And then you might, and then 
Now, you might say that, you know, right after Spanish flu ended, these businesses can reopen. They can't really, okay? Because, you know, the world was still pretty shaken right after, so there would just be this, like, usually there would be, like, this period of time where people are still very, 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 very sensitive and very, very nervous about disease, right? And they would avoid, you know, they would sort of follow some of the measures that were still in place. For example, you know, there, you know, people weren't very enthusiastic about hosting parties after Spanish flu ended, right? For example, and if you're a nightclub, you know, if you you own a nightclub, that's too sad. Okay, and a lot of businesses closed forever because the owner didn't have enough money left to restart the business. Okay, a lot of you guys don't understand, but starting a business needs money, right? You need to get the location. You need to pay the utility bills, aka electricity, water, and stuff. You need to pay for people to work for you, right? And a lot of businesses closed permanently because they didn't have enough money to do that. And this left the global economy very sort of like hollow, right? And to recover from this, especially the US, they developed the credit card system, you know, credit, checks. They replaced a lot of cash with credit. So I trust you to pay my money back. Okay, I trust you to do this, okay? And the stock market, they're based on those things, credit and stock market. What is the problem with this? Is that those two aren't like actual practical things, right? When, you know, a certain group of people suddenly realize that, hey, you know, we're basing our entire economic structure on trust, you know, trust between humans alone, okay? That means that, hey, my economic situation is very unstable. Right? So if a lot of people start realizing that, then we have a problem, okay? And on one fateful Thursday, that kind of happened, and we had the Great Depression. The Great Depression was started with a stock market crash in the US, and it basically caused an enormous economic recession around the world, okay? US, people were, you know, camping 20 like five days outside job finding agencies to find try to find a job farmers were being forced to dump food because nobody was buying them right in germany there was inflation caused by this you know the german mark went from seven thousand mark to one american dollar it just kept inflating to like fourteen thousand, and he just kept going right during the great depression there was a porter from germany he wrote that the minute he, he had to use a travel suitcase to be able to collect his salary because, you know, the money just worth too less. And then you have to literally get his, you know, himself to the store as fast as possible because one minute later, the um, actual value of his salary is going to drop. Okay. And this was all like Spanish who contributed to all of this, right? So Spanish who had an enormous impact on the global economy by making it a lot less practical and a lot more hollow and leading on to the future of Great Depression, okay? So also Spanish flu contributed to the start of World War II. I sort of talked about this previously, but here I'm gonna to go to more detail. So first of all, death toll, right? German people, very unhappy about losing a war, right? Germans back in World War I especially were actually a very proud country because the whole time before World War I, Germany had the strongest land military in Europe, and they lost the war. So of course, people were very sour. And then you have this horrible disease that was killing millions of people, making everybody scared. I think that the government isn't doing anything, right? Created, this created anger, okay? Afterwards, Spanish flu caused a lot of people to lose their jobs, even before the Great Depression. This created anger. Then the Spanish flu contributed to the Great Depression, the Great Depression happened. More people lost their jobs, heavy inflation in Germany. German government was actually absolutely like before Hitler, German government was absolutely helpless to deal with it, and the people were mad at the government. This created anger. More anger, right? And what did this anger allow? This anger allowed a very well-known psychopath known as Adolf Hitler to rise to power in Germany because a lot of his, you know, campaigns were based on anger, okay? He was, he was trying to, he, he, he gained support by directing people's anger at Jewish people, right? 
And without anger to direct, uh, he isn't going to do anything. He isn't going to rise to power, right? So, and if Hitler didn't rise to power, we wouldn't have the Holocaust. We wouldn't have World War II, right? One more factor why Spanish Rio couldn't really war to start off World War II was that during the, you know, the first drafting of the Treaty of Versailles, you know, the Treaty of Versailles was, trying, was designed to keep Germany from starting a war. And the American president, Woodrow Wilson, had this 14 statements that he was trying to pass. And one of them was create a sort of United Nations. So he was trying to create United Nations back before World War II even started. It was the infamous League of Nations that didn't work. Reason? President Woodrow Wilson wasn't able to get ideas out onto the table because he caught the Spanish flu and was sick. Okay? And he was also pretty old. He was 60-something and he caught the Spanish flu. So he couldn't get his ideas, you know, on the table. And his ideas was actually very ahead of his time. And if he couldn't, you know, tell people how to operate it, people would have no idea. So they operated the wrong way. League of Nations was an absolute failure. And it couldn't stop Germany from starting a war. You know, like right after Treaty of Versailles signed, there was this French, I think, president or politician that said, this is not a treaty to stop a war. This is a treaty. This is a ceasefire for 20 years. It was incredibly accurate. World War II broke out in 20 years. Okay? In 20 years. So that's what, you know, Spanish contributed to the start of World War II. And that is the end of my seminar. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And I'll let Emily take it away. Thank you. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, so bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.